Uh, he's worked on everything from distributed systems to uh, security and networking. Great, thanks. Yep. Okay, great. Um, thanks for joining me um, this morning. So. I don't fully know exactly the background of the audience. Um, this is going to be a little technical talk, but hopefully I'm going to give some detours in the um, wear my prof prof professorial hat for a minute and try to give you some of the background of TCP to make it make sense. Um, I should say that, you know, uh, I always want to credit joint work. Um, this is really joint work with two of my now former students. Um, Matt is uh, now at IOB, just finished his PhD at Princeton, and Sid Sen is now at Microsoft Research in New York City. So, what problem are we studying? So the title of this is uh, um, Poor Video Streaming Performance Explained and Fixed. And actually a lot of this talk is going to be try to explain uh, what lead to some persistent um, performance issues we see in streaming videos and kind of get into the nitty gritty of actually what's happening uh, here. Um, you know, I probably guess should always, it, it's not hard to justify to an audience that, you know, we all use video streaming pretty regularly. Um, Something like uh, if you could actually measure what the internet traffic is, uh, something like 78% of internet traffic is now streaming video, and just four companies combined are basically more than almost 50% of all backbone traffic, and that's for streaming video. Uh, and what's perhaps even more interesting and particularly relevant to a lot of the results of our talk is that actually, um, even from homes, that many video streams are being played uh, simultaneously. So 2014, and usually these video numbers have only ri risen since then, um, during prime time in an American household, on an average of 1.5 concurrent video streams were actually occurring. So, at, so sometimes you actually see, might see my numbers about performance, how much video um, data we're talking about. And remember, the reason why we pick some of these numbers is you're actually competing for that same pipe out of your home to many other bulk transfers, web transfers, and concurrent video streams. The last number, and then the rest of this is gonna be technical, is that the performance of this actually does matter. Um, I'm always a little hesitant to try to put a dollar price on uh, sometimes performance issues, but other companies like to, to justify their existence, and Conviva at least says uh, something like 2.6, 2.1 billion, I have to read backwards, uh, 2.1, 2.16 billion dollars were lost in 2012. That's actually probably better justified some of these numbers than, for example, when Amazon says that you know, if their website is down for one minute, they lose all this traffic. You know, with Amazon, you sometimes have customer elasticity. They might come back the next hour. Um, one of the issues with video streaming is what they find is people could start a video, and then if the performance isn't good, they actually go away. And the challenge is that often if they've already played enough of the segment of videos, they paid for the rights for that video. So the content streamer will often pay for rights for video, and if you leave partly through the video, they actually lose the ability to give you ads, which actually is meant to recoup your costs. So that's actually one of the ways that you actually lose monetary value. So really, the high goal of video streaming from the beginning was how do we want high quality, and for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna mean high bit rate, high fidelity, uh, video without any pauses. So you don't wanna ever see the little dreaded icon and it buffering. And so the general technique that people have taken in the last 10 years or, or even prior to that is called uh, ABR, adaptive bit rate encoding. So what's going to happen is that as you, your kind of goal, if you actually put this as an optimization function, your constraint is you never want any, buff, any, any pauses to occur. And so what you're going to do is try to carefully adapt the bit rate of the video that you're downloading to ensure that you always have enough buffer left over so you never actually run out of buffer and the video pauses while it downloads more content. So that's what we're going to, that kind of that's the, the high level bit. And let me just give you like the 101 on how kind of video streaming works today. It was actually, it's actually interesting. It's very different from, you know, there was just a huge amount of technical work, both in terms of research and implementation starting in the 90, 90s, of all these protocols for streaming video of the internet. And the reality is none of them came to pass and we're all using HTTP. And so let me talk for a minute about actually how this works. And generally what happens is you get a large file you will actually encode it, pre-encode it at, at several different rates, at bit rates. That could be anywhere between uh, four and sometimes 16 different bit rates. And also often for um, at lots of different type of form factors for laptops and screens, whatever. But the, for the purpose of this talk, we just care about these different encoding rates. And then you segment this file. 
Uh, and kind of standard today is that you will break this large file into four second segments. Now, the important part is the amount of time, the amount of playback time in each encoding rate is the same. What actually happens is a four segment, uh, segment at 500 kilobits per second is obviously going to be a lot smaller than one at uh, 100 and 1500 kilobits per second. Then what you do is you just use HTTP. You have a browser, it makes a vanilla HTTP request for a video segment. And you know, typically what might you might actually do is encode information about the movie, the uh, bit rate, and actually the segment all in the URL. Okay? And so what actually is happening is we designed all these fancy real-time streaming protocols and what we're actually using is just stand, is a really a DOM HTTP bulk uh, uh, transfer protocol. And what we're relying is on intelligence on the client, so-called the control plane, to decide how to switch, when to switch between different encodings, okay? So the control plane, the ABR is deciding when to switch, and the data plane is basically here just vanilla HTTP. And one of the arguments for this is that, and one of the kind of key motivators behind this approach is allowed us to basically reuse this entire ecosystem we built for the web. So this is just a static, if this is a static HTTP file, if there is a, a web proxy on the, near the client side, it can transparently cache the content and reduce transfers from upstream. Similarly, you could use kind of many existing uh, CDNs and just treat these as static files. So this is a picture of one of them, Cloudflare, but any of the, uh, many of the others could actually um, serve Limelight, Akamai, Level 3, et cetera. And I kind of already was getting to this, but really at a high level, there's fairly a simple control plane protocol that now allows us to switch between these type of things. So typically we want to make sure that we have some playback buffer. So we're going to start downloading and keep downloading until we generally reach a high watermark. Um, one of the reasons we might want a high watermark is, again, it gives us time to adapt and also from the infrastructure perspective, you don't want to download an entire 500 megabyte or gigabyte movie if the person's going to switch after watching, you know, a minute or two, right? So you generally have a high watermark and once you drain enough, when you hit the high watermark, you'll stop and once you drain a little bit, once you hit a low watermark, that these two things could even be very close to one another, you'll actually restart that download. Again, 10,000 foot view. Um, and if you actually think about how this adaptation works, obviously there's a lot of details, but at a high level, if our download rate is much faster than the playback rate, that means we have a lot of slack in the network. It means we're actually could download uh, more data while kind of giving en enough time, so we should actually increase our bit rate. Right? We have flexibility to do that. Similarly, if your download rate is less than the playback rate, that means that we're basically in steady state, just draining stuff from the buffer, so we better decrease our bit rate so we don't run out of space in our buffer and otherwise would therefore pause. And so if you think about it, what our goal is, is actually to have a download rate that equals your playback rate plus some epsilon. And I add some epsilon, which is kind of epsilon, you know, very small, uh, for two reasons. One is because you want to be slightly conservative that in case there's any changing network conditions, you give yourself enough slack that you're not kind of, you're not continuously at the edge where you're gonna, if something happens, you're gonna run out of buffer space. And the other thing that appear, that'll appear a couple times is that this rate isn't a continuous rate, it's a discretized rate. We have these fixed bit rates. So typically, while I say uh, will be epsilon, you kind of want the download rate to be greater or equal to the playback rate. And depending upon how discretized the encoding is, you actually might need more or less slack. So why do I kind of bring this up? Well, this actually leads to some interesting transfer dynamics. So what I'm actually showing here is um, each of these lines you could think about as actually as a packet. And so you, sing an HP, you send an HTTP request to the content server and you're going to get back a response, a set of responses that comprise that video segment. Or you, you could actually do this multiple times and get back a whole bunch of segments in a row, but at some point, um, you're, you may or may not pause. And I'll, and I'll come back to in a minute why this pause might be so important. But if you think about how I explained how that adaptation works, if you're downloading greater than the playback rate, 
at some point your buffer is going to fill up and you're going to, and you're going to wait till the buffer partly drains. So this client pause is kind of is arising because of this tension that uh, video streaming is going through, filling up and draining its buffer. Okay. And so what a lot of previous kind of academic work found, um, some of it a uh, nice work out of Stanford that they did with Netflix, was that these client side pauses that I talked about uh, cause the video flows to underutilize their fair share of bandwidth when competing against other flows. Uh, and their solution was kind of different adaptive bitrate. I obviously hit a lot of the specifics of how those actually worked, but slightly different adaptive bitrate algorithms that try to uh, reduce the effect of that pause and let you take more, adv more advantage of the fair share of the bandwidth. And again, why is this important? is that if we are actually downloading at less than our so-called fair share of bandwidth, then, then we are either uh, playing at a lower bit rate than necessary or experience unnecessary pauses. And in fact, um, studies have found that both low quality video and our pauses both cause people to lose, be an unhappy with their situation and, and, and seek, go elsewhere. Okay. So, I mentioned this term fair share of bandwidth and, and I apologize for whoever part of this audience uh, if this is repetitive, but I kind of want to explain what I meant here um, for a minute and so I kind of go into the one detail about how TCP works, right? And so what is actually happening is the internet was kind of this chaotic thing. It was developed with no centralization and eBay could do whatever they want and that's why all these security problems. And there's this idea that we wouldn't have, unlike the systems that predated the internet, where we actually had admission control, circuit switching, we actually would have distributed resource sharing. And the goal of TCP and other uh, like protocols is that at a high level, if two senders are sharing one bottleneck link, they should both in steady state get half the bandwidth of the bottleneck link. Now it gets a little bit more complicated because these senders tr transit many different, many, many different routers, sometimes along different paths, but this is kind of the, the model of TCP fairness. And so there's no, there's been changes, but in the general sense, there's no explicit feedback of how much you should send, send at. So what actually happened has been this distributed algorithm where the endpoints constantly explore the rate at which they should send. And so what are they, what's their signal that there's congestion? They're not actually getting a, a message from the network saying, hey, there's congestion, slow down, although there are protocols to, subsequent protocols to support that, uh, is that they actually see packet delay or loss. Loss because the buffers in the routers get filled up and they drop their packets. Delay because the buffers in the router start buffering data and their, and their packets get queued, therefore, behind other packets, right? And the way they react to this in TCP is they actually change their transmit rate. Okay, and two more slides and then we're kind of out of TCP background is that basically each sender is going to maintain this window of that basically corresponds to the amount of data it's allowed to send into the network at one time, the so-called congestion window. And the acknowledgments, acknowledgments in, in protocols like TCP are used for packet reliability, but they're also used to inform the sender about which packets are no longer in the network but therefore it allows the sender to send more data into the network because it wants to keep that congestion window size amount of data in, in the network at one time, in flight. And so it's going to adapt this based on its observations. If it loses a packet, it's going to decrease this rate and otherwise it will continuously increase the rate slower, uh, at a slow rate to basically optimistically explore. And so the trade-offs, the pro is this obviously allows you to avoid needing any type of explicit network feedback. The con is that TCP is actually continuously under and overshooting the so-called fair share of the network. So if you actually look at this, its congestion window, uh, this is kind of a classic diagram you might see called the TCP sawtooth. And what you're seeing is that it is optimistically exploring how much data there is in the network that is this additive increase period but at some point it experiences a loss and it dramatically pulls back, this so-called multiplicative decrease. And it must kind of react much quicker on loss than, than, than optimistic can explore because otherwise it causes this big congestion problem in the network when many people are trying to do this simultaneously. And the one other 
Last thing is this initial time could take a long period of time to boot up, um, especially in, in fairly uh, higher bandwidth networks today. So there's a so-called slow start phase at the beginning where you will exponentially increase until your first loss. This is strange that we call it slow start. Uh, the reason being when the first TCP was first proposed, you would actually pick a very high rate to initially send at rather than zero. So it's called slow because exponential increase is, fast, is slower than basically immediately blasting all of your traffic into the network. Okay, so that's my TCP background. And let's actually, you'll see soon why I need to kind of go into this to mention it. So kind of if we were unwound a few steps, we previously talked about the fact that these pauses are the reason that uh, video streaming seems to be handling, uh, that, that was at least the assertion of a lot of prior work in this area, that video streaming wasn't achieving its good, good, ask, uh, good fair share of the network. So it was interesting. Um, we started to look, uh, when we started to look at video streaming, we actually ran a single experiment. Um, and what you're actually uh, seeing is data that we transferred inside our, our data center. Here we're kind of managing the network to about three megabits a second. And so this should about, half of this bandwidth would be about 1.5 megabits per second. Um, although a lot of these results actually hold at higher data rates as well. And on the different choices are the different fragment size that you're transmitting, fragment size between, between pauses. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the fragment size between subsequent requests, and then it's actually, this experiment is without even doing any pauses in the network, okay? And so what you're saying is half of that link throughput, which TCP should give us, so it would be 1.5, that heavy line, and what you're seeing is most of these fragment size, even very large fragment size, even 10 megabyte files, uh, at a higher Q size in the network, were not actually achieving their fair share of network when competing against another bulk download that's basically just downloading a large file, okay? So we have, in parallel, we have this experiment running with something like iPerf that is just continuously downloading um, bulk transfers. That's kind of TCP's model of, of how the thing will behave. So this begs the question, you know, what is, um, you know, why is this not working? Whereby, um, you know, we would think that even a 10 megabyte download, or, or especially once we get to 100K files, um, you're really grossly under, under utilizing the amount of network, and in video streaming performance, this would mean you, you're achieving much, you know, probably going to much lower bit rate than you should actually do in the network. So, Again, you know, what this is actually coming back to is it really takes a careful understanding of, of the dynamics of TCP underneath, right? Because effectively what we're now doing, which we hadn't been doing before, is TCP has a control loop that is adapting, and ABR is also has a control loop that are adapting. So for any control theory, you have these two control loops that are adapting on top of each other, and that could lead to bad things if you're not careful. So there's this basic simple model, I'll make this a little bit more complicated, but there's this basic simple model of TCP utilization, which should say in order to fully utilize the network, in order to get that, your fair share of the network, your congestion window has to be bigger than what is called the bandwidth delayed product. That's not too complicated. The bandwidth delayed product, if you think about, you know, as senators told us years ago, the internet is a series of tubes. If you think about the width of the tube being the bandwidth and the length of the tube being the round trip time, then the bandwidth delay product is basically just the tube's volume. You know, it's the, it's the bandwidth times the RTT, right? So what you're saying, this again is perhaps not, not surprising that if the number of, the congestion window corresponds to the number of bytes a TCP sender is gonna send. So basically you're saying the number of bytes better fill up the volume of the tube, right, to get full utilization. Otherwise they're slacking it. Now, if you didn't have queues, you would actually see something like this. Now remember, what happens is that we react to loss aggressively. So TCP Sawtooth would have us build, 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 build. It would come up to the bandwidth delay product. It would discover that the tube is full. It couldn't send anything. There's, you can't shove anything more into a full, full tube. And it'd drop off precipitously and go into back off. And so you'd really get gross underutilization of the network. And that's actually another reason why we actually have buffers of the network. One thing is to deal with bursty, it deals with bursty traffic, but it also allows us to kind of smooth, it helps smooth the dynamics of the endpoint. So if you think of what actually happened is once you have buffers in the network, um, 
When your buffers are empty, you send, 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 it's actually filling up the buffer, and that gives you slack. And so what I added on this graph was you could view the bottom part as the amount of data that's stored in the bottleneck queue, right? So in a TCP sender that now sends well above the BDP, hits a loss, it must back off. But while it's not sending, that queue is continuing to drain, right? So you see in this graph, it drains down. The TCP sender will now say, oh, I'm not seeing more loss. I'll try to optimistically explore and I'll grow up. And this is where we get the steady state behavior, that it's this trade-off between the send rate and the data that's already shoved into the queue that allows us to maintain this kind of steady state traffic it wants. And so, by the way, feel free to uh, ask questions in the middle of the talk. Um, so what we see is that this queues in these kind of regions, they supplement the, the congestion and the amount of data that's being sent by the sender when the window is actually smaller than the volume that the, than the BDP, the volume that the tube will give you. And so kind of that yellow region becomes very important. And so we kind of could change our, our explanation a little bit in that in order to get full utilization of the network, we either want this congestion window, the number in, in flight to be greater than the, the network's volume, the tube's volume, or you want the router to actually have data queued up in it that could drain out, okay? So if we turn back to our video streaming problem again, what we see is that one of our clues is that these iterative flows don't look near the same as these bulk flows. In particular, the, what, I, what I highlighted in red, the last part of a response, in some sense acts as a synchronization barrier for the requester to then send the next chunk and causing the server here, the TCP sender, to then send a, another large batch of data. So it's a kind of in those periods of time when you kind of have space in the network that the, um, potentially the, the, the queues can be draining. And so actually, let's look at this with some traces. So how many people have actually seen a trace like this, looking like this before? Okay, so a couple, but I'm glad I, maybe that was good that I gave a couple TCP background. So what you're actually seeing, this is kind of a packet capture of, of actually a TCP trace. And it's actually telling you a lot of specifics about some of these parameters I've been talking about. So this black thing, this con congestion window, uh, this in, re uh, in blue, uh, we're seeing this uh, bandwidth delay product, this volume of the network. And in red, we're basically seeing the number of bytes outstanding, okay? Uh, and remember, the number of kind of bytes in flight are both what the sender has sent and also what's still being queued up in the, uh, in the queues. So what we actually see is that in a t typical thing, if there's no competition in the network uh, and there's no uh, pauses, we don't have any problems. And in particular, uh, if you remember our, our, how we characterized it before, we come up danger when our congestion window is less than the, the, the volume that the network can withstand uh, and there's no packets in flight. And so we saw some periods up here where these red packets dip, right? What this actually means is that the queues are draining at this point, but at least in this example, our congestion window is still large enough that we're actually not satisfying the first half of this equation. Now on the flip side, if we actually have competition with pauses, and so if you, pause, if you stop for a minute and, and think, what is actually happening is if one party is sending like the, the one on the left and the other one is parting on the right. While the guy who pauses or has a synchronization barrier, he's not sending, the bulk guy continues to send data and therefore is taking up to a disproportional amount of, of the queue. So they're actually not sharing the, um, the memory space in the queue. And so what actually happens is if we actually have competition and pauses, we see actually a lot of problems. We have um, the congestion window that is often much lower than the um, bandwidth delay product of the network, and we often have um, the number of packets, the, the queues completely drain, and so quite regularly we run into these regions of time where we actually aren't um, getting our full utilization. Now the interesting thing is even if we don't pause, it's because of the model where this is synchronization barrier, we actually could still run into problems although they're they're more, more uncommon. That is, in particular, you could see these regions, particularly when 
red has gone down to zero, there's regions where our band of delay product is greater than, than our congestion window. So this is actually, I know that's probably a lot of graphs, um, a little kind of cartoon. As the red line goes to zero, basically the Q is draining, and so we have this region up here at the time that I'm talking about where both the Q is empty and we're in this problematic space, okay? So we have this kind of causality cycle. We have the cycle of HP requests and responses. The router queues are draining between these requests, and therefore we get the network and utilization. The interesting work of this is sometimes an academic is the explanation sometimes, uh, sometimes when it's explained, hopefully clearly it seems simple, but in, in initially it didn't seem so simple. But the, the solution is actually um, at least easier to implement. And at a high level, the solution is to, of course, avoid draining the queues that often. And so really the question is, is how do we actually want to size our response trains? How, how, how do we size those long set of responses we get from a network to basically minimize the uh, underutilization while still giving us enough space to basically do adaptive bit rate encoding? Okay? So put a different way, what actually is going to happen if you look at the data that's coming out of the router? Um, there's two regions. One, when, when you're bottlenecked by the capacity of the network. Now, when I showed the cartoon, this BDP is actually dynamically changing because RTT is changing, but in the cartoon I'm kind of showing it flat. And you actually have this other underutilization period where we're actually not achieving our capacity of the network. So really, what we're actually asking is how much does this head, how much does this period, and how often are we in this period, does it drag down the average? Because what we're concerned about here is the average utilization of the network. Um, particularly with buffers and video streaming, um, you could often kind of um, amortize these litter dynamics to kind of averages because we're gonna still buffer, um, you buffer uh, you know, some enough data um, at the client side when we're doing video streaming. Um, and so what we really have is what we want to kind of ask is what is the kind of efficiency ratio, this period of time, and that's basically just going to be the average rate of the bottleneck queue over this BDP. <clears throat> and so really what we're kind of technically trying to ask is how do we actually, uh, how much to transfer before we allow the routers to drain our queues? And so what we're going to do is we're going to fix this efficiency ratio we talked about before to one minus alpha, and then we're going to, uh, for some small alpha, and we could kind of parameterize that, um, and then we're going to compute effectively the minimum size you need to transfer in order to achieve that one, one minus alpha. And so what we actually have here, what the tool we have, is that we could determine how long we want this tail to be based on how large the chunk we send, uh, and what we actually need to analytically derive is some equations of actually what this head looked like. And we can do these using kind of some more kind of model, TCP models for how it behaves in both the slow start and kind of additive increase. But we could kind of have this analytical model of TCP and then what we're actually looking at is for periods of time where the uh, congestion wind is less than BDP, how long do we want this tail for? And that, and that is giving us a size of this entire chunk. And so really, all we need to do in some sense to solve this is actually determine kind of right sizing these trains of data in our network. And in fact, we could do this in two different ways, which I, which I kind of um, wanted to get into. Um, neither, neither of which are actually very hard to implement, which is a nice thing. Um, and before I do, I just want to point out one thing, that what we're actually in some sense doing is before we actually have these two forms of control loops, we have this ABR algorithm acting at the client side that is dynamically changing the bit rate, sitting on vanilla HTTP, which sits on kind of standard TCP. And what we're actually putting in now is saying, well, where we actually could solve this problem is rather than changing this new control plane protocol, we actually could change the data plane protocol, the way we're actually fetching data. And so we're going to adaptively change chunk sizes or calculate the chunk sizes based on the network conditions which we continuously are measuring. So the two implementations are the following. Um, one is we could basically just use HTTP pipelining, okay? Um, so pipelining is um, uh, basically the idea is that in most HTTP, you send out one request and you get a single response. 
Uh, in pipelining, you're actually going to send out multiple requests simultaneously, and you don't need to, to send request two, you don't have to wait till request one finishes. Um, HTTP2 uh, basically has added greater support from pipelining. One of the traditional reasons pipelining hasn't been adopted in HTTP is because it leads to what, what's so-called known as head of line blocking. Request one can't start, you can't get request one until request, you can't get request two until request one is fully received. When you're rendering a web page, that could be a problem because an important, important part of your web page can be blocked behind an unimportant part, right? HTTP2 uh, allowed the server to reorder, kind of allowed you to kind of send these things out of order. That same problem doesn't exist in videos because you're actually just downloading sequential chunks of the, vi of the video stream and you want to watch them in order anyway, okay? So there's two things that we're actually doing with HTTP pipelining. The qu one question is, is how much data do we send outstanding at one time? And for that, we could actually just go back to our old equations that we want to just make sure we send a number of requests that will correspond to responses from the server whose size is greater than the BDP, the volume of the network. And so that is how much we basically keep in flight. And then whenever we get one response, we could issue another request. So we always have that number of uh, BDP outstanding. And then we're gonna stop when we actually hit the chunk size, right? Which is going to be that length of our train. Okay, so that has allowed us to continuously keeping in flight. It's going to almost look like a bulk transfer for that series of chunk sizes. And by chunk, I actually could mean spread over many video segments. Okay. Now there's a couple pros and cons of this. One of the nice things, it actually, um, of, the, uh, of the implementations, it experiences the um, best performance. Um, and one of the reasons uh, one of the nice things about it, because we are pipelining, the control plane algorithm could actually adapt the bit rate during the course of one chunk. We're basically getting signal down from the control plane algorithm when we're sending out chunks, so we could actually change the individual segments that we ask for as part of one long train. The pro, the cons are that it's actually not backward compatible with current browser APIs. And by that I mean uh, if you're actually writing a plugin like your Adobe or Apple or Microsoft or Google, you're fine. You could do this as an ex uh, in the browser as an extension. We did our implementation as a Chrome extension. Um, but if you're another person that's trying to implement your thing on top of the browser, you don't get enough connection control support from uh, either XML, um, the uh, X, uh, XH. R interface, XML, HTTP request interface, or the new fetch API. They don't give you enough control over this. But, um, hope, but there, we actually, there's a couple small changes they could do to the APIs that could actually support this as well if they wanted to. The second thing um, is probably even simpler, which is that we basically just use extended range requests. You know, we basically just specify in the header, um, you know, give me uh, um, a very large file. Okay, now that you're asking for a segment, but you're basically um, telling the, in some sense, you're now requesting not, a, not one video segment, you're actually requesting many segments simultaneously as part of one HTTP request. Um, the pros, in terms of the client side, it's completely backward com compatible. You just basically just need a, we implemented the whole thing as an HTML object, both for the control plane logic, as well as obviously it's pretty trivial to add an HTTP header. Um, the downside, it actually doesn't achieve quite as good utiliz network utilization. Because once you actually ask for that particular uh, chunk, you're committed to a certain bit rate. And so you can either not adapt the bit rate during that entire chunk, or if you notice a lot uh, rapidly changing behavior, you could actually kill the, the connection, uh, kill the request. In the future, if you actually had a two-way protocol, you could actually, in some sense, you could imagine you could communicate a new kill request in the application stream. Today, in, uh, in terms of implementation, we just close the TCP connection and start a new one. That obviously means the new TCP connection's got to go through slow start and all these things again, which is what degrades its performance. Um, the, other back, the other thing is that uh, while this is background compatible with today's browsers, it actually needs some support from the server because now you are just not asking for one segment, you're actually telling the, the server to actually give you a certain region. Now that actually is better than it seems um, because I kind of, uh, in the beginning, when I told you that you just ask for a static HTML file, some of the implementations, I think, um, some of the implementations store them all as separate files. 
Some implementations, I think Apple's smooth streaming does this, I, I forget offhand, actually will store them continuously as one file and you're actually doing range requests already for those protocols. So for those protocols at least, uh, it's no change on the service side. Any questions for that so far? Okay. So, because I said this was kind of a academic talk, I probably need to convince you that it actually um, works and uh, and also interestingly, have some data that shows that this is a real problem with industrial players today. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about experiment to set up. We wanted to do, for a lot of our micro benchmarks, we're doing it under controlled experiments. We did kind of in our data center. We actually have a server and a client and we're actually using a router that is actually traffic shaping the, the network to give us, to, to allow us to explore various types of network bandwidth, RTT, queue size, various parameters that we want to. Um, we have a lot more in kind of our, our, our paper, but here I kind of want to just give some high-level summaries of some of the results. Um, one of the key metrics that I've kind of used so far in this talk is a percent fair share. And so the mental model is if we have two things competing over the network, both of them should get half. Uh, and so if I say you're 90% fair share, what I'm actually saying is you're getting 90% of half that you, that you are expecting, okay? Um, for people who know a lot about TCP, this is not the same as in TCP often has this notion called Jane's fairness. The reason Jane's fairness is often talking about how TC multiple TCP are actually getting fairness with respect to one another. And here I'm really focusing on this one stream. It gives you a lot more intuition about, because there's a bunch of uh, squared parameters in Jane's fairness, it gives you a lot more intuition about how my video streaming behavior is, is operating. Okay. so. Um, the fairly standard, which I haven't talked about today, there, there's an industry standard called Dash um, that does uh, adaptive fair rate. So what we actually did was we, we compared ourselves against the Dash standard. Um, and so in a lot of these experiments, we actually used the best, so-called the best state-of-the-art ABR algorithm, um, some recent work, like I said, out of, of Stanford and Netflix, although we uh, uh, compared ourselves with simpler ABR algorithm, algorithms as well. But it's really to then isolate what benefits we're getting from the data plane changes that you made and, and we're keeping the control uh, plane the same between all these experiments. So you see with Dash is actually, um, <coughs> and what we have on, on, on the kind of, the bottoms are both the Q size and just to give you some estimate, um, the number of American households, some measurements, which actually have home routers with this Q size. Um, typically one of the, you might have heard of the term buffer, buffer bloat, some of you. Uh, home routers are often getting larger and larger, and so particularly we'll even see this, only 1% of home routers have 512 uh, kilobytes, half a megabyte buffer in your home router, but at higher bit rates, we'll actually see a larger percentage of people have that rate. So what we see is actually is as the queues get bigger, um, you know, these streaming video is performing worse. So again, so-called buffer bloat, bigger queues is even killing um, streaming video. Um, comparison to Sprint uh, X with extended pipelining and Sprint with, um, Sprint X with extended range and Sprint with pipelining. And so what we actually see is that these um, algorithms are actually achieving much closer uh, to the uh, fair share of the network. And these results kind of hold across a whole bunch of network speeds. As network speeds go up, by the way, so six megabits, this is going to mean that you have two parties competing, so it's actually a 12 megabit link, right? Um, uh, so we actually see this, the same behavior across a whole bunch of uh, different things, and again, um, larger queues at generally higher bandwidth settings. Now, so these are aggregate numbers. I think it's actually interesting, um, uh, and, and you know, some of these are pretty, um, I mean, significant. I mean, this is like 50%. Some of these existing standards are, are only getting 50% of the utilization which they get. So I kind of, it's interesting to look at some of these traces in more depth. Um, this is, that is the uh, aggregate view. Um, most of these experiments are the averages of five 25 minute runs and we'll later see, um, you'll later see minimax error bars. So this is actually showing one trace along its entire 25 minute period. And so in black, you're actually seeing our video flow uh, when in red you see bulk throughput, and you actually see that they are generally kind of like oscillating around similar parts, right? And the other interesting thing we should show here is this uh, discretized light blue line is actually the video rate. That you can see this adaptive bit rate algorithm looking to change the video rate 
when it actually determines it could actually have more or less headroom in the network. Uh, so generally what you see is this thing are, is kind of oscillating around the video throughput. Okay? So this is actually what looks like good. Now I kind of want to look at what some industry players are actually achieving. So these are, we, we kind of, this is just, again we did a bunch of aggregate measurements, but this is from single traces just to give you some sense of the dynamics. So uh, when we measured Amazon, we were getting about 50% of its fair share. Um, and so what we actually did here was we first started the video flow. And so here you could see it going up to three, which means that it can actually fill up the, um, the network. And then five minutes into the experiment, we started our bulk transfer. And so what we actually saw is Amazon, rather than these two things converging to basically the middle, Amazon is actually only achieving about 50% of its, of its fair share. And you could, uh, the light blue line is you could see the thing rapidly kind of adapting its bit rate, but really centered around that data line, okay? Um, I have one, now you could ask, well maybe this is a discretization problem. Maybe it actually doesn't have enough t different levels of encoding. So what actually the red line is showing is the fair share is when we didn't have anything competing, but we now shape the network at 1.5. Right? And so we saw when we had a 1.5 megabyte, it could actually fill that up, and it was at a three megabyte network when it was actually competing that it was getting much lower than that. Now there could be a whole bunch of reasons why it's deciding to send a lower date, but we think one thing that is fairly compelling is that when it did have the headroom, it was able to, uh, it used it, and it was only when it actually hit TCP competition that it actually underutilized it. And we saw this across a whole bunch of different players. So uh, Hulu, um, only about 27% of our fair share. Uh, Netflix similarly, um, and here we actually weren't able to detect the, the video. There, with the experiment, I don't show the blue line because we weren't, weren't able to detect the video bit rate, the way it was giving us information. Um, but you could really see it really only uses 21% of its fair share. Um, any Google, Googlers in the audience? You probably turned out the best. Um, YouTube was about getting 71% uh, of its fair share. Um, but again, we, we kind of saw persistent problems across many of these different players. Um, if you look at this in somewhat aggregate, um, again, this is, those were the dynamics and this is kind of where we came up with this pr um, percentage. Um, the interesting thing is you could ask, you know, is this due to the adaptive bit rate encoding or a fixed bit rate? So we tried a bunch with these different players to basically fix some of those players you could force what bit rate to run at. And so we tried different bit rates and even there, uh, we basically didn't come, even at kind of the best results, we couldn't come close to the uh, fair share of the network. Um, Amazon didn't allow us to manually fix the bit rate, which is why we don't show a graph there. Any questions with that? Um, we also actually, interestingly, um, performed a lot of these same experiments over a mobile network, over T-Mobile's network, and actually saw really persistent, similar problems with all industrial players, uh, and improvements once we added Sprint onto it. Uh, we have some more results in the paper if you want. Um, and the last thing I want to show, I'm probably going to end a bit early, is that um, when I talked about this as being, you know, this is basically just a data plane protocol, right? And then the question is, was really, do we want just a better control plane protocol? Because that's what most of the prior work attempted to do. Um, what we actually found is we actually experimented with a whole bunch of uh, different kind of control plane protocols and settings. Um, and kind of this was the state of the art one that we used in um, a bunch of our experiments, the, this new work um, that I mentioned, this new academic work, um, but when we actually didn't have this multiple pipeline train, this is the right size chunking that I talked about, what we see is even with the best control plane protocol, and uh, we still actually saw um, notable improvements by having this type of data plane adaptation. And sometimes with the existing DASH standards, like I said, you actually perform much, much worse. Okay, um, so, Again, what's, a, what's an academic talk without related work? Um, there has been prior work showing um, experimental, uh, showing these problems, uh, and that uh, when you actually had two players, we would see these type of synchronization problems, which identified as, as being the problems. Uh, and some of the recent work has identified these client size pauses as uh, leading to this negative feedback loop. What kind of our work was able to do was actually realize that a lot of this problem is actually due to a data plane problem as opposed to a control plane adaptive bit rate. Um, problem, uh, kind of understand, kind of, and again, uh, the uh, 
a detailed understanding of why this is actually happening based on the network dynamics, um, show that actually just trying to solve this at the control plane are actually insufficient, um, and using kind of various, uh, again, um, we do this in a paper, the various models of, the analytic models of how TCP behaves to actually figure out exactly how to right size this chunk. So rather than just saying for all conditions, the problem with most network protocols is you don't wanna just pick a parameter that says we're gonna choose it to be X number of bytes for all conditions because what's really happening is network conditions, I differ greatly across settings, home, tethered, uh, phone, coffee house, and also even for one connection, they adaptively change during the course of a video as other people join and leave the network and the network conditions change. So really you do need protocols that are aware of these network conditions and could use that as the model to adaptively um, do this type of right sizing. So this is probably the first time I, I, I gave a talk where I ended significantly early, but hopefully that'll give us more time for a coffee break. Um, are there any questions? Thank you. Microphone, behind you. Um, could you please share some uh, more details? Uh, how did you derive um, the chunk size from uh, the network conditions? The chunk size, oh. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to, I, I, I honestly don't um, recall enough of the, uh, the mo so basically what you, what you need to do is there's different, uh, we have different equations for um, how TCP be is behaving in slow start, um, how it's actually behaving um, in additive increase, um, and how it's actually behaving. There's like three different regimes that we talk about um, that TCP is behaving in. And so what we're actually um, doing, uh, sorry, I I'm happy to share the, share the paper offhand. I'm probably not gonna reconstruct the equations uh, here. But what we're basically doing is um, looking at those equations, because remember that tail is actually relatively easy, right? Because the tail is BDP. We get that from measured conditions of round trip time, and um, um, you could actually estimate the um, bandwidth of the network by, again, seeing what you're actually getting in terms of throughput and, and the effect of RTT on it. So um, my short answer is no, I cannot. <laughs> but I'm happy to do offline. Hi, Dr. Friedman. Uh, my name is Amr. Uh, I'm in, in the application development and user experiences. So uh, you mentioned that a lot of the video right now is being streamed by major, major carriers, uh, like the major content delivery networks. Um, and you know it, they kind of are dependent on browser technology that is deployed. Uh, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of visionaries try to talk about the the use of the internet changing to be a little bit more peer to peer. Um, over okay. over time, and you know, not just like kind of like black market stuff, but we're also talking about things that you know may be more everyday. Sure, sure. Um, and do you, do you see an opportunity to kind of put a lot of these ideas that you have on how to improve uh, kind <coughs> of video streaming? Is it is there more opportunity to perhaps do this at the peer to peer level where there's maybe more freedom to innovate? Sure. Sure, so this is a very apropos question. So um, my background, a lot of my actually PhD thesis was in peer-to-peer. Um, -peer. um, this was starting in 2001 when P2P was hot. Um, I built, I don't know how many people, if anybody's in this audience have heard of Coral CDN. Um, so this was, um, I, had to, I built kind of a peer-to-peer -peer CDN. And we deployed in 2004, I actually ran it for about 10 years. Um, it would. Uh, it would get around a couple million users a day. It was deployed about 500 sites worldwide. Um, actually, one of its initial big use cases, it was so-called to solve the slash out effect, although that website isn't really that popular anymore. Um, one of the big use cases was actually the Asian tsunami in 2004. Um, this actually predated YouTube, if you could think back then. A lot of the amateur videos were actually being delivered by Coral CDN. Um, so I did work a lot in peer-to-peer -peer CDNs in the past. Um, and as I was at Stanford, I uh, started having a lot of venture capitalists ask me to then start a company on this and, and, and go off and do something. Um, there were a lot of peer-to-peer -peer CDNs that started and um, none of them were successful. And I think they weren't uh, successful um, for the following reason, which is in fact, 
Um, another popular, semi-popular peer-to-peer CDN um, was called Red Swoosh. Akamai bought it. I don't know if people know the current CEO of Uber. His last company was a peer-to-peer -peer CDN company called, called Red Swoosh. Uh, $12 million exit wasn't as popular as his current one. So the reason it wasn't is because if you actually look at the economics of at least um, professional video, um, I think some metrics that to, to send an hour long, um, to, send, to, to deliver an hour long uh, version of Breaking Bad will in today's bandwidth uh, regime cost about two to three cents for the CDN providers. And they'll probably pay about a dollar or two in content licensing. And so what this means is what this drives is actually the reason peer-to-peer -peer never took off for high quality, often professional content, was the economics of internet interconnect have been made bandwidth so cheap and that um, they would lose way more money in terms of lost opportunity for advertising revenue than it would cost them to actually pay somebody to deliver their content. Um, and so what we actually saw, and this actually, you know, the high time of peer-to-peer, -peer, there's a lot of interesting work going on 2001, 2006. And if you actually look where this actually predated was the rise of cloud computing. And once cloud computing came about in 2006, 2007, a lot of the, the arguments for peer-to-peer -peer were about cost. They very quickly went away, both because of some of the economies of scale of, 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 of cloud computing and the fact that a small company you know, when Akamai went out to initially deliver a CDN, it actually had to physically ship servers all over the world. And that whole problem went away. So allowed, it lowered the barrier to entry. So the only place you actually see, I mean, I was kind of a, a group that, you know, there was some conference that became Tor, that I, I was, I worked with people that eventually built Tor and um, uh, BitTorrent, and, and the, the, this was the original peer-to-peer -peer cadre. Probably the only place you saw it was BitTorrent, and really the main use of BitTorrent, it is used for, I know, Linux distros, but the main use of BitTorrent is for content, um, you know, that is perhaps, at least in many years, that, that is not on the wide area, is that not legally um, delivered. Um, so I don't think those economics have changed much to make this new regime of peer-to-peer -peer transfers and everything. Um, the fascination with Bitcoin, perhaps notwithstanding. I think, I, I think a different answer is now I, I've, I've grown enough gray hair that I could be grouchy about the past, so it's now the next generation who forgets everything that happened before and now actually drives things forward. Uh, hi, Gary Duzan. Um, real quick question. Um, in, in your testing, um, did you, were you able to confirm that you were getting um, at whatever the selected bit rate that you're actually keeping the, the player buffer full through through the whole test. We so had no pause. We all. had no pauses in these experiments. Okay. Oh, um, oh, 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 well, I mean, it's not. I mean, not not introduced pauses, but I mean, you you didn't underflow the buffer and and like lose video because you know the the network was misbehaving or whatever at whatever selected bit band, uh, bandwidth. Buffer, are you talking about in the router? No, I'm talking about in the player. So, the, so player. the player has, has, has to buffer the stuff, you know, the video uh, as we, it's coming through. So if that underflows, then, then you, you glitch your video. We, we, didn't, we, didn't, we, we did not encounter anything that we were able to measure. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, you mentioned that you were testing against a steady stream of uh, like a download going in the background. You also mentioned that a lot of times more than one stream are happening at a time. Did you do any testing against two of these or three of these going on at the same time and how they affect each other? Yeah, we, we did. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. So th this is a good question. So like, you know, how realistic are, I mean, the problem is, you know, what, there's two, there's two answers here. You know, what we probably have in most homes is we actually have a wide variety of, of, of conditions going on. We have people doing web traffic, very interactive, people doing larger transfers, people doing video. Um, we did experiment multiple uh, video stream at the same time, and we actually also saw um, a lack of fair share. Um, I should probably have uh, uh, given some of those videos as well. Um, I don't remember offhand exactly the percentage that the different um, players were achieving, but we did see similar problems. We, no, sorry, what I meant is our protocol was behaving better than the, than the previous ones. One of the, one of the reasons why is because um, if not, they would, 
You can imagine that if these two players are really tightly coupled, that if they were behaving very similarly, that they could um, kind of get the fair share. But with a lot of these things, the problem with these adaptive control plane protocols is once actually something is, becomes more dominant, then it can actually continue to basically dominate the other one. It filled up the queue, the next guy sees more packet loss when it tries to send in the queue, it drops off further. And so you could actually have these conditions when you have this strange behavior that even two TCP flows with all these other noise going along will actually sometimes lead to non-fair share when they're not basically adopting this kind of like standard model. Any last questions? Okay, thanks a lot.